and it, it's very interesting that it leads us to our second question, which is every day more now we are talking about the concept of English as a lingua franca, yeah. much more than that distinction between American English and British English. So we are moving towards a more international English. Something that comes up a lot in those groups is how do we actually uh, teach speaking? How do we propose speaking activities? And we manage to preserve students' identity when they're speaking. Yeah, I was really interested by that question. So I, I think there's two or three things going on within that question. I think one is, in terms of the lingua franca thing, it ties in very much to the accuracy thing. I, I run this group on Facebook called English Questions Answered. It's basically for teachers and advanced level students to ask questions. One of the things I've realised from there is notions of correctness are much more slippery than I'd previously imagined. So there was a question recently about Someone said, that must not have been much fun. Is this correct? And it was like, well, for me as a Brit, I wouldn't say it. I would always say that can't have been much fun. But I know that in North America, that's a common variant. And so now if I have a student who says that mustn't have been much fun, part of me just thinks as an English, as a lingua franca person, let it go. If the Americ It's a bit like the present perfect stuff. You know, the Americans don't use it as much as the Brits do. If a student uses the present, you know, uses the past simple where I might use the present perfect and it's the way that the Americans would do it, for me, I just let that stuff go. So I think part of the lingua franca thing is to do with not imposing the kind of rigid grammatical norms and accuracies that maybe we would have done 10 years ago, being a bit more relaxed about it, just thinking... Hey, both of those are fine. In terms of preserving your identity, I think part of that's to do with accent. Um, I think as a native speaker who's got a non-standard RP accent, I was very conscious of it when I started teaching. I, you know, I'm a London boy. And, and so for me, I, I, don't, I don't sound like I speak received pronunciation. I sound like I'm from London, sometimes more than others. You know, if I heard a couple of beers, I sound very London. <laughs> and so for me, part of preserving my identity is I want the right to sound like I'm from where I'm from. I don't want to be forced to conform to something that for me feels like a kind of oppressive upper middle class southern standard spoken mainly by people whose politics I have problems with. I think part of the way we respect students individual identities is through allowing them to sound like they're from where they're from. If a student sounds like they speak Portuguese as their first language and even if I can hear hey I can tell from your accent you're probably Brazilian because I mean I can hear as someone lives in London I can tell when I hear you speak English generally I can tell if you're a Portuguese speaker of Portuguese or if you're a Brazilian speaker of Portuguese even when you're speaking English because the tones are slightly different the accents are different and for me I, that's a good thing I, th I think that's a healthy thing different people sound different because you're from different places I think also on top of that it's just as a teacher sometimes allowing space for local expressions it's not kind of punishing students I'll give you an example so I was in Russia recently and we were eating this Russian dish and they said, what would you call this dish in English? And I said, I would call it Kasha because that's the Russian name for it. And we don't have this in English. Okay, it's like feijoada. Okay, you could translate yeah. feijoada as rice and beans, but calling it rice and beans in English doesn't capture what feijoada is. Feijoada is feijoada. You know, capirinha is capirinha. So I think it's, it's allowing people to keep those local forms of expression. If someone has an idiom in their language and they translate it, fine, tell them, you know, that's not a normal English expression, but know what you mean and is that how you say it in Brazilian Portuguese okay it's a nice expression let's keep it I think it's, it's it's that kind of thing it's it's allowing people the right to sound like where they're from and allowing people to use local frames of reference without forcing that into a kind of an English box if you like and then after that I think it's just letting people talk about things that are real and meaningful to them because you know, I mean, when I'm speaking my main foreign language, which is Indonesian, I still feel like me. I don't feel like I'm Indonesian, you know, I'm, I'm still me. There's some things about the language which frustrate me, like in English, I swear more because there's more swear words and we're, we're more of a sweary people. Mm -hmm. Indonesian's a bit more polite. So sometimes when I'm speaking Indonesian, I kind of feel like, ah, ah, where are the words to express how I feel about this? You have that, but I still talk about the same kinds of things I talk about when I'm talking English, you know? I don't know. I don't think 
a Brazilian speaker loses their identity because they're speaking in a foreign language. So long as the person that they're interacting with allows them to express their lives and their realities and their identities. And you can do that through English just as you can do that through, you know, you could learn Arabic and still be a Brazilian, but you just expressing your reality through a different language. And the language may impact slightly on what it's possible for you to say, but you will also impact on the language. You know, and I, and I think it's, it's allowing non-natives that space to be creative, to bend the language, to bring their own accents to it, to bring their own music and identities to the language and, and celebrating that, you know? Lo there's lots of things that other people are interested to know about the language, your, your native language. I have an example. I was with a group of... Uh, teachers that speak English as a first language, like I had a problem with my computer. And my reaction was, when I, when I reacted to that, I said something that we say in Portuguese. I said, I said Vish. it's an expression, like, uh, and they, 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 they loved it. And they, they started using it in some oh, context. Yeah. Like, Most times I'd say it's frustrating for the student when he cannot express, like, you should know how funny I am in my first language. Why am I not this? <laughs> And I think it's just that openness to, to, to it's a two-way street, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's the, the native speakers recognizing, oh, you've got a word that you use in this, oh, I like it, I like it, you know? and, and using those and playing with those, and I'm sure for native speakers who talk to a lot of Brazilian Portuguese speakers, you know, you, you, when I'm speaking Indonesian with Indonesian friends, we switch between the two languages all the time. There becomes a kind of localized variant of English that's familiar to people who also speak Indonesian. And I'm sure you've got that with native speakers who've lived in Brazil for a long time. They'll understand all that kind of dish stuff, you know, and they'll maybe do that even when they're speaking English themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that. I think it's it's recognizing and accepting the two-way street, you know, and not just imposing. It must be like this because this is how we do it. 